suggests a bit. Way to get somebody to leave your stream. Hamlin towns and Brunswick, my famous Hanover city, the river western deep and wide washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you've never spied, but when begins my ditty, almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles and ate the cheeses from the vats and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats may nest men's Sunday hats, and even spoil the women's chats by drowning out their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last, people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mayor is a naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking, to think we buy gowns lined with vermin, adults who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you're old and obese to find in the furry civic road of keys. Browse up, sirs, give your brains a racking. Find the remedy we are lacking, for sure as fate will send you packing. But this is Mary Corporation quake for mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council. At length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder eyed my ermine gown sell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. 
I'm sure my poor head aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Jesse said this what should hap. At the chamber door, but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation that he sat, looking little through wondrous fat. No brighter were his eyes, no moister, than a too long open oyster. Save when it knew his paunch and muteness, for a plate of turtle green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on a mat. Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pit a pat. Uh, the, I'm making bagels, and I'm reciting uh, The Pied Piper of Hamlin by Robert Browning. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and then did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, and light loose hair and swarthy skin, nor tuft of hair on cheek nor beard on chin, but lips were smile when in, out and in, there was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire his tall, his tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's as my great grandsire, starting up at the trump of doom's tone, I'd walk this way from his painted tombstone. Oh, thanks, man. Interesting. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I thought about rapping it. I could try to rap it. Hamlin Town of Brunswick, by famous Hanover City. The river, western, deep and wide, washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasant pot you never spied, but when begins my ditty? Almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was pity. <laughs> Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats, bit the babies in the cradles, and ate the cheeses from the vats and licked the soup from the cooks on ladles. Split open the caves, assaulted the sprats, made nest the men said they had, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking, and shrieking and speaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last, people in a body took down all came and flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mare is naughty. Uh, I've, I've recited that I've, I've recited it a few thousand times. I think repetition. That that's my secret. That's the only secret I have. Repetition, practice, practice, practice. Uh, it's called Rosemary Rock Salt. We're located in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, we're a bagel bakery. Uh, there we have four locations. Well, we have five, but we're gonna have four because uh, one of our locations is gonna be demolished because it's gonna be. Uh, um, they're gonna make a SkyTrain station in that that block, and then, uh, the, our store is one of the stores that needs to be demolished. So we're we're gonna be down to four stores pretty soon here in uh, in June. We're getting demolished. It's the best store too. I, I love that store, and it's it's sort of sad that we're uh, we're getting forced forced out of that location. I guess it's for the good of the city, though. We have better transit. Uh, I, I guess I should just finish this poem I was reciting. Uh, it's not that old. It, the, the, this location's only four year, four, uh, five years old, four years old. Um, uh, the, yeah, so the ovens is, is the, it's the same age as the uh, building, or the same age as the business. As the uh, it's a, it's a, a wood stone fire deck oven. Uh, they're, they're made down in Be uh, Bellingham, Washington. Uh, I need to get a, I need to find my scraper here. So.
Yeah, no, the oven's not old at all. It's like four or five years old. I bet, I bet you anything this oven will last, well, uh, uh, you know, a good while though. They're built. They're built to last, I think. Uh, let me finish the poem. Uh, I, I have a hard time starting. Well, I don't know where I left off, so I'll just start again. Oh, sorry if it's boring. I uh, don't oh, know, just for fun. I'm here. I'm here alone in the morning, so I don't know. It gives me something to do. It gives me an opportunity to have a conversation with strangers over the internet. My employer hasn't said anything about it yet, so I guess uh, I have their tacit consent, maybe, I don't know. like I have something to share yeah it's early uh, yeah I, I, I stream because I feel like I have something to share and I want to share it so that's what I'm doing sharing my, my passion for bageling and my my passion for poetry my passion for storytelling my passion for music Oh, thanks. Thank you. Oh. Let me uh, let me try to finish that poem. I, I haven't been I haven't been practicing much lately. Uh, I, I'll just start from the start again. Actually, maybe I'll start, I'll do a story first, and then I'll go back to the poem. There once was a young man named Roland Pye who played recorder when he wasn't baking bagels. One day he was walking through a park and playing his recorder with Restavoff from all his baking when suddenly he spied a corpse lying on the ground beneath a swarm of flies. He put down his recorder, walked over to the corpse, shooed the flies away, and covered the dead man with stones. Returning to his oven later that day, he found that his oven blade had gone on by itself and already baked half the bagels he needed. From that day on, Roland Pye was the happiest baker alive. He'd bake until he was tired, then he'd pull his recorder out of his pocket while his oven weight went on by itself. But Roland Pye lived in a town whose mayor did not admire his skill and was jealous of his fame. So the mayor devised a plan to rid the town of Roland. In the beginning, he said that Roland was a good worker, but lazy. Next, he said that Roland baked a whole lot, but badly. Then he accused Roland of being a sorcerer, and the people turned on him. Therefore, Roland Pye took his recorder and left his home behind. When Roland Pye came to a neighboring town, he went to all the business owners, but none of them would give him any work. Finally, he met an old busker and asked him for work to keep body and mind together. Come along with me, said the old man, and we will share alms. So Roland Pied and the old man started going around and singing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to cream. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and batch the boards. You don't need their applause for things that is yours. You are a baker, and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Everybody gave alms to the old man, but the old man said, What is a young man like you out begging? Why don't you work for a living? Nobody will hire me, replied Roland Pye. That's what you say. There is a king with so many hungry soldiers that he'll pay good wages to anyone willing to feed them. 
So Roll Clyde went to the king's kitchen and took the old man whose alms he'd been sharing. The oven had never been used by anyone. Roland mixed the dough, then he rolled it into rings, then he boiled them, then he dressed them with seeds, baked them until they were golden brown, then he tossed them into a crate to cool down. Whenever Roland weary of baking, he'd play his recorder. Once he was weary of playing his recorder, he would sing. Make a lot of rare little style of things. Make how did you forget the standards we are? Make an old woman loves her well. Although it is gold and you're good for health. Make her you are too dirty for a lover to wish to cream. Your limbs are the knots the cord of an old fashioned machine. Make her line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their claws for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are. Not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Hearing the scene, the princess looked out the window. She saw Roland Pie and fell in love with him. But she was a princess and he a baker. The king would never consent to their marriage. So they decided to run away together. They fled at night in a boat. They were already on the high seas and Roland remembered the busker. He said to his beloved, we must fetch the old man since he shared his alms with me. We can't go off and leave him like that. At that very moment, the old man came up behind the boat, walking on the water as though it had been dry land. Reaching the boat, he said, we agreed to divide everything we had and I shared everything I own. Now you have the king's daughter and you must give half of her to me. At this, he gave Roland Pye the knife to cut his bride in two. Roland Pye took the knife with a trembling hand. You are right, he said. You are perfectly right. He was on the point of cutting his bride in two, when suddenly the old man stopped him. Stop! I knew you were a just man. I am the dead man, mind you, whom you covered with stones. Go now, and may the two of you always be happy. At this the old man walked away on the waves. The boat came to an island rich in all good things, with a princely palace awaiting the newlyweds. Oh, thank you. Have a good day. Thanks for watching. Brand new Shiva. Hamlin Towns in Brunswick by famous Hanover City. The river Wester deep and wide washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you've never spied. When begins my ditty? Almost 500 years ago. To see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats, and picked the babies from the cradle, made the cheeses from the vats, and licked the soup from the cooks on ladles. Split up on the cake and sold its brats, made nest men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled women's chats by drowning out their speaking, with shrieking and squeaking, and picked the different sharks and flats. At last, people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Clear try day, our mayor is a naughty, and as for our corporations, shocking. 
think we buy gowns lined with ermine, for dolts who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you're old and obese to find in the furry civic row keys. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking to find the remedy we are lacking, for sure as fate will send you packing. At this, the mayor and corporation quaked with a mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council, at length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder eyed my room and gown cell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I scratch it so but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just he said this what should happen. At the chamber door but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little to wonder his fat. Nor brighter were his eyes, nor moister than a too long opened oyster. Save when in noon his paunch grew mutinous for a plate of turtle green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on the mat. Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go in a path. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger. And in did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red. And he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin and light loose hair and swarthy skin, nor tuft of hair on cheek, nor beard on chin. The lips were smile went out and in, there was no guessing his kiss or kin, and nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's as my great-grandsire, starting up with the trump of doom's tone, had walked this way from his tainted tombstone. He advanced towards the council table. Please, your honor, said he, I am able, by means of secret charm to draw, all the creatures living beneath the sun, that crawl or swim or fly or run, after me, so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper, and people call me the Pied Piper. And here they notice round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe, to match with his coat to same check. And at scarf's end, I'm a pipe. And his fingers they notice were ever straying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe, as low it dangled over his vesture soul fangled. Yes, said he, Pied Piper as I am, in Tartari I fred the cam, last June from his huge swarms of gnats. I eased in Asia the Nizam of a monstrous brood of vampire bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I rid your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand was the exclamation, an astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Like a musical adept to blow his pipe, his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, he heard as if an army muttered, and a muttering grew to a grumbling, and a grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling. Great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, Grave old plotters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, clocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the Pied Piper for their lives. From street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the River Wesser, where it all plunged and perished, save one stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he the manuscript he cherished, to Radland home his commentary. Which was, at first shrill notes of the pipe, I heard a sound as of scraping trice, and putting apples wondrous ripe into the cider press and grape, and moving away a pickle tub board, and leaving a jar of concert covered, and drawing the corks of train all glass, and breaking hoops of butter cast. It seemed as if a voice sweeter far than by heart or by soul or in thee, called out, Oh, rats, rejoice, the world is growing to a vast dry saltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your lunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just enough walky sugar punch on. Oh, you stay like a great sun shone. Gracious, scarce an inch before me. Just me thought it said come for me. I found the west are rolling over me. You should have heard the town and people. Ring the bells and draw up the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, get long pole. Poke the nest and lock up the hole. Consult with carpenters and builders. Leave now town not even a trace of the rats. When suddenly up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace. The first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders, the mayor looked blue, so did the corporation too. For council dinners made her havoc with Clarae himself in the Grob Hawk. And half the money were to punish, they sell his biggest butt and Frenish, to pay the sum to a wondering fellow, with gypsy coat red and yellow. 
besides Great America going weak. Our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with their eyes the vermin sink. What's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink and a matter of money to put in your coat. But as for the guild is what we spoke of them, as you well know, was in joke. Besides, both the marathon knowing me, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes and heard the same. Once that can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink and a matter of money to put in your coat. But as for the guild of what we spoke of them, as you well know, was in joke. Besides, your losses which made us thrifty. A thousand guilders, come, take fifty. The piper's face fell and he cried. No trifling, I can't wait beside. I promise a visit by dinner time, Baghdad, and accept the prime of the head cook's potage. All these rich in, having left in the Kato's kitchen, of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I prove no bargain driver. With you don't think I'll bait a stiver. The folks who put me in a passion, they find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried Mary, do you think I broke? Being was treated then a cook, insulted by a rival, with idle pipe and vegetable piebald. Threaten us, fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe of smooth straight cane. And there he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as if musicians kind of never gave him raptured air. There's a rustling that seemed like a bustling of merry crowds jostling and pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, little tongues chattering. Like foals in a farm with a barley and scattering, all came the children running, all the little boys and girls. With rosy cheeks and flax and curls, with sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping around merrily after. The wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood, as if they're changed in the blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry, to the children merrily skipping by. Could only follow with an eye that joyous crowd at the piper's back. Now the mayor was on the rack, and the wretched council's bosom beat as the piper turned from the high street to where the west had rolled its waters right in the way of their sons and daughters. Now we turned from south to west, the cop of our kill his steps addressed, and after him the children pressed, great was the joy in every breast. He never crossed the mighty talk, his voice let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollow, the piper advanced and the children followed, when all were into the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all? No one was lame, did not dance the whole of the way. Even in afternoon, if you blame the sadness, he was used to say, It's dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget the time for rap. All the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me, for he led us to, for he led, as he said, to a joyous land. And just at hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew, flowers were forth fair hue, and everything was strange to me. The sparrow was bright a peacock here, our dogs were round our fellow deer, and honeybees had lost their strings, and horses were born with eagles' wings. And just as I became assured, my lame foot be speedily cured, the music stopped, and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left behind against my will, to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas, for Hamelin, there came into many a burger's pate, a text which says at heaven's gate, opes the rich at his easy rate, as the needle's eye takes a camel in. The mayor said east, west, north, and south, tossing the piper by word of mouth, wherever it was men's law to find him. Silver and gold, his heart's content, if only he'd return the way he went, and bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was lost and ever, and piper and dances were gone forever, they made a decree with lawyers never, to think their records dated duly, if after the day of the month and year, these words do not as well appear. And so long after what happened here, on the 22nd of July, 1376, the better memory fix, the place of the children's last retreat, they called it the Pied Piper Street, where anyone playing pipe or tabor was short for his own to his labor, or suffered big hostel or tavern, shocked his words the streets of solemn, and opposite the place up the cavern, there was a story on a column, and then on the great church window painted, the same to make the world acquainted, how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day. And I must not admit to say, that in Transylvania there is a tribe of alien people who ascribe the way and dress in which the neighbors lay such stress to their fathers and mothers having risen, on some subterranean prison into which they were Japan, a long time ago in a mighty band, out of Hamlin towns and Brunswick land, but how or why they don't understand. So, Lily, let me and you be wipers, 
of scores out with all men, especially pipers. If they should pipe us free from rats and from life, if we promise not, let us keep our promise. In the end. There once was a rich man who had just one son. The boy was dearly loved by his father. As everybody knows, the greatest scourge on earth for a rich man is work. Therefore, when his son turned 14, the father decided to send him to school to learn the science of laziness. On the same street as the rich man, there lived a famous and highly respected professor who had never done a lick of work in his life he could get out of doing. The rich man called on him found him stretched out in the garden under a fig tree with a cushion under his head, a cushion under his back, and a cushion under his buttocks. Before talking to him, I must first see how he does, said the rich man to himself, and he hid behind the hedge to observe the man. The professor lay as still as a corpse with his eyes closed. The only time he moved was whenever he heard the thud of a right fig falling on the ground near where he lay. He reached slowly out, bringing the fruit to his mouth, Swallowing. Then he wouldn't stir again until another fig fell. This is just the professor my son needs, decided the rich man. And he came out from his hiding place, introduced himself, and asked the professor if he'd teach his son the science of laziness. Old man, answered the professor just above a whisper, don't talk so much. It tires me to listen to you. If you want to bring your son up as you and I are, just send him to me. So the rich man went home to his son, took his son by the hand, thrust a feathered pillow under his arm, and led him to the garden. I urge you, he told them, to do everything you see this professor of idleness do. The boy, who already had an inclination for that particular science, also stretched out under the fig tree. Observing his teacher, he saw him reach for every fig that fell and bring it to his mouth. Why should I work myself to death reaching for fakes, he thought. He lay in there with his mouth wide open. Soon a fig fell into his mouth and he let it down, go down slowly. Then he reopened his mouth. Another fig fell. This time it missed. He lay in there perfectly still and murmured, Why so wide of the mark? Fig fall into my mouth. Seeing how wise his pupil already was, the professor said, go on now. You have nothing to learn from me. You can even teach me something. So the boy went home to his father to thank Tabitha for having given him such a smart son. Do do loo do.
do 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 first thought was he lied in every word, that hoary cripple with malicious eye, askance to watch the working of his lie on mine, a mouth scarce able to afford suppression of the glee the cursed and scored a dead jab one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for with his staff? What saved Whaley with his lies is there? All travelers might find the posted there, and ask the road. I guess what skull like laugh would break, what crutch can write my epitaph of pastime in the dusty thoroughfare. If at his counsel I should turn aside into ominous track which all agree hides the dark tower, yet acquiescing I had to turn as he pointed, neither pride nor hope rekindling at the end described, so much as gladness some end might be. For what with my whole world wide wondering, what with my search drawn out through years, my hope dwindled into a ghost not fit to cope with that obstreperous joy success would bring. I hardly tried now to rebuke the spring my heart made finding failure in his scope. As a sick man very near to death seems dead indeed, and feels begin and end the tears, and takes the farewell of each friend, and hears one bid the other go, draw breath freely outside. Since all is over, he saith, and the blow fallen, no grieving can amend. While some discuss if near the graves be room enough for this, or when a day suits best for carrying the corpse away, with care about banners, scarves, and stays, and still the man hears all and only craves, he may not shame such tender love and stay. Thus I have to go on suffered in this quest, her failure prophesied so oft being writ, so many times among the band of wit, the knights who two dark towers search to address their steps, but just to fail as they seem best, and all doubt was now should I be fit. So quiet as the spirit turned from him, that hateful cripple out of his highway into the path he pointed, all the day had been in fury one at best, and dim was settling into his clothes, and it shot one grim red deer to see the pain catch its spray. For Mark, no sooner was I fairly found, pledged the pain after a case or two, pausing for back with a last one, over the safe road was gone, great plain all round, nothing but pain in the horizon down, I must go on, not else for me. So on I went, I think I never saw some star of the noble nature, nothing throve, for flowers as well expect to see her grow, but chores were according to their law, and propagate their kind with none to all, to think a bird in a treasure trove. No pen may hear the same face in some strange sort where their last portion, see or close your eyes to nature's beauty, nothing skills, I can't help my case, tis last judgment's fire must cure this place, calcine is flawed and sent by prisoners free. 
If they're pushing the ragged pistol stalk above its meats its head was chalk. The bents were jealous elves. What made the holes and rents in the dark forest towards thieves? Bruises and walk all hope of greenness. Tis a brute must walk, passing their life over the brute's intents. As for the grass, it grew as scarce as hair and leprosy. Thin dry blades pricked the mud, which underneath it kneaded up with blood. One stiff blind horse is every bone a stare. Stood stupefied however he came there. Thrust out past service from the devil's stud. Alive, he might be dead for aught I know. With red, gaunt, and calloped neck is frame, and shut eyes beneath the rusty mane. Seldom went such grotesqueness with such woe. I never saw a brute I hated so. He must have been wicked to deserve such pain. I shut my eyes and turned them on my heart, as a man calls for wine before he fights. I asked one draft of earlier, happier sights. They're fit that I can hope to play the part. Think first, wait afterward, the soldier's heart. One taste of old times, it's all to rights. Not it. I fancied Cuthbert's rending face beneath its garniture of curly gold. Dear fellow, till I almost felt him fold. An arm and mind affixed me to that place. That way he used, alas, one night's disgrace. Oh, in my heart's new fire and left it cold. Giles then, the soul of honor, there he stands. Frank is ten years ago and made it first. An honest man should dare to say yours. Good, but the scene shifts. Call what hangman's hand pinned to his breast of parchment. His own band reads it, poor traitor spit upon and cursed. Better this present than a past like that. Back therefore to my darkening path. Will sound the sight as far as the eye can swing. Will the nights in a hallowed or a bad ass? When something on the dismal flat came to arrest my thoughts and change their train. A sudden little river crossed my path. As unexpected as a serpent came, who tides congenial to the glooms. This is the froth by might have been a bath of the fiend's hope. Poof the sea the glutton. Alive, is it? Alive, you might be dead for aught I know, with red, gaunt, and calf neck screen, and shut eyes beneath the rusty mane. Seldom went such grotesqueness with such woe. I never saw a brute I hated so. He must have been wicked to deserve such pain. I shut my eyes and turned them on my heart. As a man calls for wine before he fights, I asked one draft of earlier, happy insights. For fitly I could hope to play the part. Think first, fight afterwards, a soldier's art. One taste of old time sets all to rights. No, I, I fancied Cuthbert's reddening face beneath its garniture of curly gold. Dear fellow, till I almost felt him fold. An arm in mine to fix me to that place, that way he used. Alas, one night's disgrace, I wet my heart's new fire and left it cold. Giles then, the soul of honor, there he stands. Frank is ten years ago, a night at first. An honest man should dare and say he durst. Good, but the scene shifts. Fall, when hangman's hand picked to his breast and parchment. His own band reads it. Poor traitor, spit upon and cursed. Better this present than a past like that. Back, therefore, to my darkening path. No sound will sight as far as the eye can strain. Will the nights that hallowed or bad ass? If something on the dismal flat came to rest my thoughts and change their train. A sudden little river crossed my path. As unexpected as a serpent came. No tides congenial to the glooms. This is a froth fight. Might have been a bath with the fiends blowing loose. To see the wrath with black eddies be spat with flakes and spoons. So petty it so spiteful. All along, those scrubby alders kneeled over it. Drenched willows flung them headlong, the fit to run the fair, a suicidal throng, the river which had done them all the wrong, whatever that was, rolled by and threw no way. Which while I courted good saints, how I feared to set my foot upon a dead man's cheek, he stepped a field of spear at breast to seek for hollow tangle in his hair or beard, and may have been a water rat of spear, but ugh, it sounded like the baby's shriek. Clap beside the each other bank, now for a better country, being presage. Who were the strugglers? What war did they wage? Whose savage trample could thus pad the dank soil to a clash? Toads in a poison tank, the wild cats in a red hot cage. The fight must so have seemed in that foul sir. What penned them there with all the plain to choose? No footsteps leading to that horrid muse. None out of it. Mad Bruins set to work their brains, no doubt, like galley slaves and turkey pits for his pastime fishing these games Jews. And more than that, a furlong on, why there, or what bad use was that engine for, or that wheel, or break not wheel, the harrow fit to reel men's bodies out like silk, with all the air of Tophet's tool, on earth left unaware, brought to sharpen its rusty teeth with steel. Then came some stub ground, once wood, next to marsh it seen, now near earth, desperate and done with, so the fool finds mirth, makes a thing and mars it, till his mood changes and off he goes, within a rude bog, clay and marsh, sand and stark black dearth. 
Now blotches rankling colored gay and grim. Now patches where some meanness of the soils broke new moss or substances like boils. Then came a palsied oak, a cleft in him, a distorted mouth that splits its rim, gaping at death and dies while it recoils. As far as ever come the end, not in the distance but the evening off, point my footsteps further at the pot. Great black bird, a pollen was the friend, sailed past to be his wide wings dragon pen, to brush my cap for chance to guide I saw it. For looking up where I sent my crew, plain and given place all round the mountains with such names of grace, mere heights and heaps now stolen in view. How thus they surprised me, solving you. How to get from there was no clear case. Yet half I seemed to recognize some trick of mischief had happened to me. God knows when, in a bad dream perhaps, here ended and progress this way. When in the very nick of giving up one more time came to click, just in the traction, you're in the den. Burningly it came upon me all at once. This was the place, those two hills crouched like two bulls, one horn and horn in fight, all to about the tall scalp mountain, dunce of daughter and a dozing at the very nuns, after a lifetime of training for the sight. Not see, because of night birth. What in the midst lay the, the tower itself, the round squat turret, blind as a fool's heart, built the brown dome without a counterpart of the whole world. The tempest mocking out points the ship and thus the unseen shell he strikes on only when timber is starved. Not see, because of night perhaps, why day came back for that? By behind it left the dying sunset, kindled through a cleft, the hills like two giants in the hunting lay, chin upon hand to see the game at bay, now stab and end the creature to the heft. Not here, when noise was everywhere it told, increasing like a bell, names in my ears, of lost adventurers my peers, how such was strong and such was bold, and such was fortunate, yet each of old, lost, lost, were moment now in long years. There they stood, ranged along the hillside back, the view last of me, a living frame, for one more picture in a sheet of flame, I saw them and knew them all, and yet, dauntless the slughorn to my lips I set, and blew, child roll into a dark tower came. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another, and assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and nature of God entitle them a decent respect to the opinions of mankind, requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by the universe with certain unalienable rights, but among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments instituted by men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. And whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of people to alter or abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundations on such principles, and organizing its power in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect the safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for like to transient causes. The experience accordingly has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer when evils are sufferable than right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they have become accustomed. But when long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces the design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is the necessity which constrains them to alter their form of systems of governance, government. The history of the present King of England is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a kind of world. Is refused to send to laws more wholesome and necessary for the public good.